delighted today to be interviewing my very good friend and fellow author, Jennifer Kloster. We both share a deep love of the novels of Georgette Heyer, and Jennifer is renowned as the author of Georgette Heyer's Regency World and also the authorised biography of the writer. So it's lovely to have you here today. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Susanna. Lovely to be here. Now, Jennifer, tell me how you first came to Georgette's novels and which of her books would you recommend to somebody who has never read a single one of her works? Oh, gosh. Uh, I first came to her living in the jungle in Papua New Guinea and they had a little tiny YWCA library and it was full of Georgette Heyer and Robert Ludlam and I read both of them and I think These Old Shades was my first, uh, many people's first, I believe. And then when we went to live in the Middle East some years later, the library there also had an entire collection of Georgette Hare novels. So I reread her um, and just, just loved her. She's, she's my comfort reading, my go-to reading. Um, she's just superb prose, but the stories are wonderful, very funny, witty, um, and the characters just live for the reader, I think. So recommending, um, gosh, well, I love the talisman ring. She wrote that, I think, with her tongue firmly in her cheek. It's got a little bit of a mystery detective story, but it's got two couples who are complete opposites, a younger, very sort of naive and passionate couple, and then the older, more sensible, but very witty, very humorous couple. And the two come together to solve this murder mystery, and it's very, very funny. So I love that one. There's so many. I mean, it's impossible to have a favourite because it changes all the time. But I think a lot of people would recommend The Grand Sophie, Frederica, um, Venetia. Uh, My first was Arabella. And oh, I think that's a really good first one. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yes, a lovely starting point. Sylvester was another of my very early ones, and they have remained two of my top favourites. But Absolutely. I think you're right. Really, whichever one you happen to be reading at the time tends to be the one that you particularly love. Yes, probably best not to start with Pihalo or My Lord John. Or, or even Cousin, Cousin Kate. Kate. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> or Charity Girl, for that matter. But the la those last two were written when she was in the last years of her life. And even so, she wrote Frederica when she was 64 or 63, and that is a remarkably good book, you know, amazing. Jennifer, I know you've written a fabulous novel called Jane Austen's Ghost. Does reading the books of Jane Austen and knowing more about the Regency period give you an added appreciation of Georgette's world and, and her fiction? Oh, very much so, and particularly because Jane Austen was Georgette Hare's favourite author. Um, along with Shakespeare and Dickens. But Jane Austen was her choice, should she have ever been uh, marooned on a desert island. Um, and you can find all these gorgeous Austen-esque moments throughout the Hare canon. Um, and if you know you're Austen, it's quite fun. Like Sylvester, for example, has wonderful bits of sort of, not bits of, but there are homages to Pride and Prejudice, for example. There's a delightful bit at the end where the hero has proposed to the heroine and she's written a book previously and she suggests she write a second book and that she could write a marvellous dedication with lots of encomiums and it remind, reminds you of the dedication that Austen was forced to write for the Prince Regent in Emma. And so Haya plays these lovely little games with those who are in the know, um, Austen, uh, Austen moments in Haya novels. So I really enjoy that. Yeah, I mean, Austen's so enriching. Yeah. You spoke earlier about the sort of therapy, the comfort of reading her novels, and I've always found the same. Mm. And I have found that over these last two years of COVID, I have been turning very regularly to her fabulous novels because mm. there is a sort of reassurance, a wonderful comfort about reading them. There's also the humour. And in the time when every time you turn the television news on, it's okay. something depressing. I think we really need that humour from her books. So have, have you found yourself reading her books more during the, the couple of years of COVID? Oh, very much so. Um, and I just uh, reread False Colours, which has actually got that marvellous character, Sabonomy Ripple. And there are some just fabulous scenes, uh, particularly between Sabonomy and then later Lady Denville. And the scene towards the end when they're both in their night gear, 
It's just hilarious. So, I mean, that's the thing about hey, and what you say is absolutely true. And Austin's another wonderful go-to comfort read. And I think it's to do partly with this sort of structured world. You get this sense of civilised manners and and humour and, and wit. And both authors, I mean, very different because Austin, no one can touch Austin, but but Haya has her own way of depicting human nature and you get every kind of character, almost as you do in Austin where, you know, you, they, they're able to tease things out. And I think you're sort of safe but, but entertained. Haya is particularly entertaining. Um, Austin gives you more, but, but they're both obviously wonderful reads. Um, and I love the language of Haya. Uh, her Regency dialogue is often just so vivid and, and, and funny. So laugh I out think, loud yeah. funny. So yeah, funny. laugh out loud funny. Uh, Absolutely. You laugh out loud. Yes. You do, yeah. You really and do. she's actually the only author who has ever made me laugh out loud, really. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that really drew me to her. Yes. You know, yes. and of course, you know, one of the things that people in the pandemic have been turned back to books and, and Hay has had a big resurgence too, um, of course, and Bridgerton was such a success. Well, of course, we wouldn't have Bridgerton if we didn't have Hayer, who created that genre of, mm -hmm. you know, what is now the modern Regency. And I just so, wish they would film some of her oh. novels in, in the way that, well, they could do a better job than they had done with, with filming Bridgerton. Yes, well, I think we're going to, uh, we're working on a documentary. We're hoping that will, will come on and um, perhaps that will then lead to, um, you know, one of the or more of the novels being filmed. They really ought to be turned into TV series, I think. They really should. They'd make yeah. marvellous films. Really Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Really great. Jennifer, I'd like to ask you about the snobbery connected with, with her novels. So often when I tell people that I love the novels of Georgette Heyer, they say, oh, I read them in my teens, but then I moved on to better things. <laughs> uh, and I think, well, you know, you're the loser there. But there is this mista totally mistaken perception that she's sort of one step up from the dreaded Mills and Boons, that because she wrote romances, therefore her books don't count, they don't matter, they're not quality literature. Now, I know that you and I both feel that that's rubbish, that that's a completely mm -hmm. mistaken view. But how do you counter that when somebody says to you, oh, she's just, uh, you know, she's almost like Mills and Boone or Barbara Cartland? Well, the first thing I'd say, uh, well, first thing I'd say is that there's nothing wrong with Mills and Boone. You just have to understand that it's genre fiction. It's it's doing a particular job and there are lots of people who love it and that's absolutely fine. Secondly, I'd say there's nothing wrong with romance. I mean, what's wrong with romance? I've never understood this. Every great classic novel, every, you know, popular fiction storyteller has every a Shakespeare music. play. Yeah, every Shakespeare play has a romance in it. I mean, it, every song is about love. You know, most songs are about love and finding the right. Look at Ed Sheeran. Why is he so popular? Because he sings about love and finding the one. So I've never understood this, this constant denigration of romance as if there's something wrong with love. Isn't, isn't love what we all want? As for hair, well, I think part of what's happened is She's been shifted in her cover art particularly, and Stephen Fry points this out. Um, she was always just a sort of unisex author. Um, you know, men and women, women read her. Uh, these days she's sort of pushed as sort of, you know, feminine or women's fiction, which I've always found odd because we don't have men's fiction. You know, why do we have to categorise? But I guess publishers have found that useful as a selling point, and that's fine. I think my greatest counter would be, okay, well, you say you've moved on. Who have you moved on to? And do you think they'll still be selling in the millions a hundred years after they've published their first novel? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Haya's doing. Mm -hmm. She's still selling in big numbers and it's a hundred years since she published her first book, written when she was 17, by the way. Mm -hmm. How many 17-year-old authors still have their book in print a hundred years after publication? Yes. So I think, you know, she's, she's almost 50 years since her death. She's still selling. She's still a, a beloved author to now five generations of readers. And I don't think that happens all that often. No. For most, you know, most writers, you know, even, even my books and sadly possibly your book, Susanna, probably won't be around, you know, <laughs> even in 10 years, never mind 100. So it's not that common for authors to endure. Mm. But Hayer endures. 
and you know. she is still fascinating other authors mm. people like Stephen Fry who you mm. mentioned A.S. Byatt I believe William Faulkner loved her novels Margaret Drabble there are so many authors who hold her in extremely high esteem and authors who have themselves very very high critical standards and they absolutely fight in her books and that's partly because her prose is so good you know she has a literary quality there's a you know to, to emulate her work well i mean there isn't a modern and there are there are lots of very good modern regency authors out there who sell to millions of people but no one has been able to do what Haya did no one has been able to create the world in the way that she and she's a world builder sometimes she gets compared to people like pg woodhouse you know these people they created a world and you you enter it and it's it's completely believable it's mm -hmm. it's real to the reader and i think that's one of the things that draws people back time and time again because she's not a one-off read you return to her novels and there again is another really strong counter as to why she should be esteemed and valued and she is esteemed and valued by millions of people it's just i think it's those who perhaps haven't read her or perhaps read her when they were young and thought well that sort of teenage reading as i mean i don't go back and reread enid blyton you know because that's what i read as a child and that's childish it's, it's it has its place but hair is a reread and people read her throughout their lives and i think that's really telling and I think, too, they today can fortunately read her in different ways, mm. such as the marvellous unabridged audio version oh. of her books, which are a total delight. I listen to them as I'm cooking or driving the car, and it just... It, I, I just don't want the stories to stop. They yes, are so yes. delightful in audio version. It is true. And you get things out of the audio that you don't always get just reading it. And I found that fascinating. I've just listened to Phil as a Nash reading A Civil Contract. I've probably listened to it three times in the last month or so uh, because it's on my blog. You know, I write a week, almost weekly blog on, on the next Haya novel and um, False Colours goes up today, part one. And A Civil Contract, when you hear it, and Phil as a Nash does the most brilliant job, it's just so nuanced. There's so much in that novel. It's really a work of genius, actually. Yes, absolutely. So on that note, uh, I would like to first of all mention the International Hayer Society. Mm. Jennifer and I are both lady patronesses of the society. It's a society on the internet and uh, it, can, it sends out wonderful newsletters and articles. And Jennifer, of course, contributes many pieces about Hayer's life and, and her writings. Uh, so let me strongly recommend that if you are a Hayer fan, you might be interested in joining the International Haya Society. And Jennifer's two wonderful books about Haya, the many articles and pieces that she has written, her blog, and her fabulous fun novel, Jane Austen's Ghost. So once you get addicted to Haya, there is plenty of other reading that you mm. can move on to. Jennifer and I could probably talk for <laughs> hours. In fact, we have in the past talked for hours about this author that we both get so much pleasure from. Mm. But it's been lovely to chat to you today, Jennifer. Thank you so much. And let's continue to love the novels of Georgette Hayer. Delighted. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Go out and read her. <laughs>